Hi everybody, this is Larry Snyder from Lehigh University and this is a tutorial on the modeling language AMPL. For this tutorial, I'm assuming that you've already learned something about linear programming and integer programming, that you know what a continuous and a binary variable are, you know things like objective functions and constraints, and that maybe you've had a little bit of experience implementing simple optimization models in AMPL or another modeling language. And I'm also assuming that you have the AMPL software installed on your computer so that you can follow along with the examples and exercises in this tutorial. If you don't have that, it's not critical, but it will be helpful if you're able to um, type the AMPL stuff while I'm giving the tutorial and make sure that you're following along. So I'll first give you a short introduction to AMPL. Then we'll talk about a specific problem called the Center County problem. We'll talk about two different forms of that problem, one that's called the explicit form and one that's a more general algebraic form, and implement both of those in AMPL, play around with it a little bit. We'll talk about things that can go wrong in your AMPL code and how to fix them, and then give another example which comes from the Hillier and Lieberman textbook called Wind or Glass, a few other facts about AMPL that are useful to know, and finally a model that you can implement on your own and um, see how you do. So let's first talk about AMPL's role in the modeling process. So when you learn optimization models in class or in textbooks, we tend to write them like this. They're a lot of algebra, a couple of words, and um, a lot of Greek symbols. However, the solver, the algorithm that's gonna solve that problem needs the models to look like this, basically just a matrix and a couple of vectors. And that matrix and vectors are a lot less intuitive than the algebraic notation that's on the left. And so AMPL's role is to do the translating. AMPL lets you write something that looks a lot like the models that we write down on a piece of paper or on the chalkboard and translates them into the data, the matrices and vectors that the solver needs, and then translates the results of the solver back into something that we can read. AMPL, when you look at AMPL code, it looks sort of like a blend of algebraic notation and computer code. There's lots of stuff that looks like computer code here. There are keywords, there are comment markers, there are semicolons, um, but then there's also things that look like the algebraic notation that we used in the models that we wrote down on paper. For example, we have an objective function down at the bottom. It says maximize profit and then some code that looks sort of like algebra. We have a sum, and the sum is over uh, a set of products, and what we're summing up is a coefficient times a variable, and then we have some constraints that say subject to, and so it starts to look a little bit like the algebraic form that we're more used to. So some basics about AMPL. First of all, it's case sensitive. If you use uppercase letters when you define a variable, then you have to use uppercase letters every time you use that variable and so on. But AMPL ignores white space. You can put in as many spaces or tabs or hard returns as you'd like, and AMPL doesn't really care. Your model is gonna go into a, a text file, um, and those files are usually, usually have a .mod or .dat extension. And then you're going to use the AMPL prompt to type commands like solve, which tell AMPL to solve that model. You can put comments in your files. In fact, you should, it's a good idea. And the symbol that denotes a comment is the number sign. And every line, every command in an AMPL file has to end with a semicolon. So let's look at a specific problem. In this problem, we have a county in Pennsylvania, Center County, that's considering four potential community development projects. They're considering building a park or a basketball court or a recreation center or a swimming pool or some combination of those. And for each of those four potential projects, we know the daily usage, meaning how many people will use that facility. We know the cost to build it, and we know how much space it takes up in acres. And one uh, slight complication here is that the basketball court will be built inside the park, so it takes no additional space, but we can't build the basketball court unless we choose to build the park. We have some constraints. We have $200,000 available from a state grant, and that's all we can spend. And we have 15 acres available to build on. And the goal is to select projects to maximize the daily usage subject to the budget and land constraints. <clears throat> 
And this problem is an example from a book by Ravindran et al. called Service Systems Engineering and Management, if you want to track down the original. So here's what this model looks like in algebraic form. We want to maximize an objective function, which sometimes we call z. That objective function equals, for each of the four potential projects, we have the usage per day of that project, 600 people per day for the park, and so on times a variable x1, x2, x3, x4 that represent whether or not we decide to build that project. So eventually x, the xj's are going to be binary variables, but for now I'm letting them be continuous. But you can think of x1 for now as indicating sort of what percentage of the project we're going to invest in, which is maybe a silly thing to think about, but that's how we'll interpret this model so far. And then the second line is the budget constraint. It says if we're going to fully invest in the park. If we're going to open the park, we're going to spend 50 on it. If we invest in the second project, which is the basketball court, then we'll spend 20 on it and so on. And the total amount that we spend has to be less than 200. Of course, all of these units are in thousands of dollars, but I've taken out the, the last three digits just to save some space. The second constraint is the space constraint. Remember that the park takes up eight acres, the basketball court takes zero acres, and so on. And so the sum of all of that space usage has to be less than or equal to 15. And then all of the variables have to be between zero and one. As I said, eventually these will be binary, but for now we'll let them be continuous. Also for now, we're going to ignore the constraint that says we can only build the basketball court if we build the park. So what I would like you to do now is to open Ample and create a file that's called center.mod. And in that file, type the text that's at the bottom of this slide. So you can pause your, pause your video and type that text. Now you can save your file. And before you do anything else with it, let's notice a couple things here. First of all, every line in this file ends with a semicolon. That's what tells Ample that we're finished with a set of commands. The decision variables are declared using the keyword VAR. The objective function is declared using the keyword maximize, although of course we can solve minimization problems too, in which case we use the minimize keyword. Constraints are declared using the keywords subject to, and you can also shorten that to subj to if you like. And the objective function and the constraints each get a name. So the objective function is called profit, and the constraints are called budget and space. And you can call the objective function and constraints pretty much whatever you want. You have to avoid keywords and so on, but you can. there's no strict rules about how you name those things, whatever works best for you and for the model. Now, now that you've saved your, your model, go to the Ample prompt in your Ample software. You should see Ample and then a colon. That's the Ample prompt. And at that prompt, type exactly what's written here, model center.mod semicolon. That line tells Ample which model you want to solve. Then type option solver cplex semicolon. That tells Ample which solver you want to use. If you don't have cplex installed in your Ample installation, you can replace it with a different solver here. For now, we're just solving a simple LP, so just about any solver will do. Later on, we'll need to solve integer programming problems, and so you'll need a solver that can solve integer programs. After you've chosen your solver, type the word solve, semicolon, and that's what tells Ample to actually solve the model. And a split second later, you should see some kind of output that looks like this. If you're using Cplex, the output should look just like this, and if you're using another solver, you should see something different. But most solvers will give output that tells you that it finished solving the problem, that it was successful, it found the optimal solution. Here it says that the objective function value for the optimal solution is 1320, and that it was very fast to do it. It just took one iteration of the dual simplex method. That part of the information is less important for us, but from time to time in your modeling career, you may find yourself using that information. So congratulations, you just solved your first ample model. So in the output from Cplex, it tells us that the optimal objective function value is 1320, but we probably want to know more about the optimal solution than just that. For example, we'd like to find out the values of the decision variables. And to do that, we use the display command to ask Ample to tell us the values of those variables. 
So you can type dis at the ample prompt, you can type display and then one or more variables separated by commas um, and then a semicolon. And so if you type display x1 comma x2 comma x3 comma x4 semicolon, you'll get ample to tell you the values of all of these decision variables. And so this says that x1, x2, and x4 each equal 1, and x3 equals 0 0.4. Now, of course, we want these decision variables to be binary. We can't invest 0 0.4 in the swimming pool or whatever it was. So we need the variables to either equal 0 or 1. Well, that's easy to do in AMPL. In the lines where you declared your decision variables in your center.mod file, just replace the greater than or equal to zero, less than or equal to one part with the keyword binary. So the top part of your mod file should now look like this. And now that we have binary decision variables, we can also add logical constraints, constraints that enforce bits of logic. In particular, we can add a constraint that says, if we, use if we invest in the basketball court, then we have to invest in the park. The way to write that constraint logically is to say x2 is less than or equal to x1. In other words, if x2 is 1, then x1 also has to be 1. And the syntax for writing that in your ample mod file is subject to some name, I'll call it if basketball then park, a colon to say now we're ready to start the actual constraint, and then the algebra that tells us the constraint. So type that into your model file, save it. And now we have to tell Ample to reset what it already knows. If you just tried to solve the new model, it would be solving the original model that you loaded before. So type the word reset, semicolon, then again reload the model with model center.mod, semicolon, and then solve it again. You don't need to type option solver cplex because Ample remembers what solver you were using before and it continues to use that solver. So now you can see that the, C, the Cplex output is telling us that it found not only an optimal solution, but an optimal integer solution. Its objective function value is 1,200. It makes sense that the optimal objective function value went down because this is a maximization problem and we just added a new constraint. We added constraints saying that the decision variables have to be binary and adding a constraint can only hurt the objective function value. In this case, it's a maximization problem. So hurting the objective function value means getting smaller. And, um, the, and Cplex give you some, gives you some more information about how many simplex iterations and how many branch and bound nodes it took. So again, let's find out the values of the variables at the ample prompt type display x1, x2, x3, x4. And yay, they're binary. x1, x2, and x4 are equal to 1, and x3 is equal to 0. By the way, when you're at the ample prompt, you can use the up and down arrow keys on your keyboard to quickly scroll through the earlier commands. So if you didn't want to type display x1, x2, x3, x4 again, you can just tap the up arrow a couple times until you get back to that line that you typed earlier and hit return. Okay, now let's move on to a general algebraic form. So, so far so good. We typed in a model, we solved the model, but our model had four decision variables. Real world optimization models can have hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands of decision variables. And this type of way of entering in a model into Ample would be a big pain if you had so many decision variables. So the solution is to use sets to index our parameters, decision variables, summations, and constraints. So again, let's omit the if basketball then part constraint for now, just because it's a little bit trickier. We'll come back to that later. And I now want you to create a new file called centercounty.mod. And this file is going to contain a totally different way of writing down our optimization model. So in your centercounty.mod file, type in the text that's at the bottom of this slide. Why don't you pause the video while you do that, and then come back and we'll talk through what's going on in this text. So in this text, notice that, first of all, the parameters and variables are indexed by the set. So we've created a set called projects that'll contain the four potential projects. And then each of the parameters and decision variables is indexed by that set. So when you say something like param usage curly braces projects, what that means is I want to declare a new parameter called usage. And there should be one of those parameters for each project in the set of projects. 
So this is just like the parameters that we called, I think, uj before that told us what is the usage per day for each of the potential projects. That's how we declare it in ample syntax. I like to include comments to, on the right-hand side that tells us in more sort of plain English what these terms represent. So we have a parameter for the usage, a parameter for the cost, and a parameter for the amount of space that each project takes up. And we also index our decision variables with the set of projects. So the decision variable line says we have a decision variable called select that's going to indicate whether or not we select a certain project. Those decision variables are indexed by the set of projects and they're binary. Then we have the objective function. We want to maximize the total usage. And the way we write the sum in the objective function is to write the keyword sum followed by curly braces. In the curly braces, we'll say the, key, the word projects that refers to the set, but we'll also tell it what is the index we're going to use within that sum to indicate the elements of that set. So this means I'm going to loop through all the elements in the set projects, and I'm going to call each one of them in turn J. And for each project J in the set projects, we want to take the usage of that project J times the decision variable select for that project J, and then sum all of those up. And that gives us our objective function called total usage. We have a constraint called budget that says, again, sum up over all the projects, the cost of the budget, the cost of the project times one if we select it. And that sum has to be less than or equal to 200. And similarly, a constraint for land available that when we sum up all of the space requirements of the projects we select, that has to be less than or equal to 15. Notice that in the objective function and the constraints, we use square brackets to indicate the parameters and variables. We put the index inside those square variables. So something like usage, I'm sorry, in the bottom here, this should say usage J, not usage P, but you get the idea. Um, the number sign or hashtag sign indicates a comment, and what that means is that Ample will ignore everything that comes after that on the line. And the summation indices, as we said, are indicated with curly braces. Okay, but there's no numbers in this model. We don't have any way of specifying yet how much space each project uses or how much each project costs. So we need some way to provide the data, meaning the values of the parameters, as well as the elements that are in the sets. And those data have to go into a separate file called a .dat file. And the separation of the model logic and the data numbers is central to Ample's philosophy. So this is the pattern that you should follow in your Ample code. The objective function and constraints and declarations all go into a model file that specifies the logic of your model. And then in a separate data file, you give it all the numbers that it needs. So here's the data file, the .dat file for Center County. And in this data file, we first specify the items in the set projects and then the values of each parameter. So create a new file called centercounty.dat, type in this text, you can pause the video while you're doing it, and then come back when you're ready. So in the data file, notice that the lines still end with semicolons, but a line here doesn't really mean one line on the screen. It means one line of commands. So you give it a command like param usage, and then you specify all the values of the usage parameter, and then a semicolon at the end of that line of commands. The set elements can be strings. So we've declared the set projects to equal the elements park, basketball, rec, and pool. And they can also be numbers. So in your, in your um, ample models, you'll sometimes find yourself using sets that contain only numbers and sometimes sets that contain strings. And finally, the declarations all use the colon equal symbol to say, OK, I'm about to tell you all the values for projects, or I'm about to tell you all the values for usage. Ample data file syntax can be a little bit finicky. Um, this is quite a simple data file. In more complicated data files where you want to do things like declaring multiple parameters at once or declaring parameters that are indexed by more than one um, set, the syntax can get kind of finicky, and you may find yourself often 
looking back at older examples to figure out how to how to do it. Um, but this is the basics. So now that you've revised your, you've created this new model and new data file, let's reset at the ample prompt, type model center county dot mod. And now a new type of command, it's called the data command that tells it which data file we want to use. So type data center county dot dat, of course, end with a semicolon, and then let's solve. And when you solve it, Cplex gives you the optimal objective function value of 1200. You can display the decision variables just like before. And now you don't need to say, you don't need to list each of the decision variables individually. You just list the name of the decision variables, and then it will loop through all the items in the set and display them. So you can just write display select, and it displays the value of the select variable for all of the elements in the project set. This is the exact same solution as before, which is not surprising because it's the same model and same data. It's just a totally different way of writing it. Now let's add the constraint that says, if we use the basketball court, then we have to use the park. And in that constraint, um, we have to specify specific values of the project set. So we need a constraint that says the value of select for basketball is less than or equal to the value of select for the word park, for, for, the, um, for the park. And whenever you have set elements in a constraint like this that are strings, you have to enclose them in single quotes. So the syntax looks like this. And we already know that the solution will be the same because we've solved it both with and without the if basketball then park constraint, but let's solve it anyway. So we'll add that constraint back add it to your model file, and then type the commands at the bottom. Pause your video if you need to, and then solve the model. And you should get the results below that again say that the optimal objective function value is 1200. Now, in your DAT file, you have three sets of parameters, usage, cost, and space, that all have the same index set. They're all indexed by the set projects. And there's a more compact syntax that you can use that avoids having to write the set, the, the elements in the set multiple times. And that syntax says that you, do, you type the word param and then a colon, and then you type the names of each of the parameters that you're about to declare and then a colon equals. And then you can just write for each element, all three of the parameters. So for, for park, we have a usage of 600, a cost of 50, a space of eight, and so on. And this is a sort of tabular form. It's more compact than the way we did it before. Um, it doesn't matter what, where you put the tabs or spaces or carriage returns, um, the white space doesn't matter, but I find that it's a lot easier to read if you get the alignment to look a little bit more like a like a table. This is one example of the type of finicky syntax. When I'm building data files with this kind of syntax, to be honest, I always forget where the colons and colon equals go, and I always just have to look back at an earlier example. So if you'd like to try this out, type it into your dat file, replace the text that's in there currently, and try solving it again, and you should get the same results as we got before. Now, in our model file, the right-hand sides of the constraints are written as numbers. We have this budget of 200 and space available of 15. It's a good practice to avoid hard coding any numbers in the mod file. We really don't want to have any numbers in there. Instead, we can declare those as parameters and then specify their values in the dat file. So in your mod file, create two new parameters, one called budget and one called land avail. And then in the right-hand sides of the constraints, take out the numbers and replace them with those parameters. Finally, go into your dat file and add these two new parameters into it and declare the values that you want those parameters to have. Pause your video if you need to, and then go back to the ample prompt, type reset to reset everything that ample remembers, tell it to load your model and your data, tell it to solve and display the values of the variable select, and yay, 
everything worked out exactly the same, which is not surprising, again, because we're solving the exact same model, we're just doing it with different syntax. Now, our constraints all have just one copy per constraint. We have one budget constraint and one land constraint and one if basketball then park constraint. But in most models, we have constraints that are also indexed by sets. So for example, let's suppose that, and, and when you write those algebraically, we use the for all notation, right? We have some constraint for all J in the set of projects, for example. So let's suppose we want to add a constraint that says that the total amount that we spend on each project can be no more than 60. So that constraint would say something like CJ, XJ less than or equal to 60 for all J and P. This is actually a pretty silly constraint because what this is telling the model is if the cost of the project is more than 60, then we just can't use it. Um, and there are other ways to write that that are a little bit simpler, but anyway, here's a simple constraint and hopefully you follow along with the logic of it. So this constraint needs a for all, and the way we do that in Ample is to index the constraints themselves. So right after the name of the constraint, which in this, in this case I called max spend per project, you'll add curly braces that says the index and the name of the set, and in the, after the, the colon that tells Ample that you're about to tell it the logic of the constraint, you will use the index that you declared earlier, J, to loop through the individual parameters and decision variables. So again, this is exactly analogous to the algebraic way of writing this constraint at the top of the slide, but it uses Ample syntax here. By the way, the index that you use can be anything. I called it J, but you could call it P because it's projects, or you could call it hippopotamus. It doesn't matter what you call it in the declaration of the constraint, as long as you then use the same thing every time you refer to that, um, to that index later within the scope of that constraint. Now, of course, I put the 60 in the right-hand side here, but I also told you that I don't like to have numbers hard-coded in the mod file. So instead, it would be cleaner to put a new parameter called max spend, and that's the max spend per project. Replace the right-hand side of 60 with the new parameter, max spend. And then in your data file, declare this new parameter, max spend, set it equal to 60. Pause the video here if you need to. Make those changes, and then resolve your model. And what you should find now is that the objective function has gone down even more. The new constraint hurt the objective function because now we're not allowed to spend, we're not allowed to select the pool or the rec center because they are too expensive. All right, now that we've solved a couple of models and tried take an ample for a spin, let's talk about some of the things that can go wrong. In my experience with students using ample, one of the most frustrating things is that you'll get syntax errors from Ample that you don't quite know how to diagnose. And I can't give you um, a full list of all the things that can go wrong, but I'm gonna tell you some of the things that I've seen happen frequently um, and show you what the syntax errors look like so that hopefully if you encounter those in the future, it'll be a little bit easier to diagnose and fix. So the first thing is that Ample is great at recognizing what I call dangling subscripts. So a dangling subscript is a subscript, an index, that hasn't been declared in either a sum or a for all. So if you look at this version of the mod file, I have a objective function total usage, and then in the objective function, I use the, in, the index j, but I forgot the part that says sum j in projects. So I'm using an index j that I haven't yet declared, and that's a dangling subscript. So if you type if you ask Ample to, to load that model, it'll immediately give you an error message that says, hey, you're using an index J that you haven't defined. And then you can go back and fix that by adding in the sum. Or if you forget it in a constraint, for example, you forget that the max spend per project constraint will be indexed by J and you just use the J without adding the, the declaration, adding the J in the declaration, then you'll get an error message that similarly says, hey, you're using J, but J hasn't been defined. Now, 
a perfectly valid constraint would have a for all j, and a perfectly valid constraint would have a sum over j. When I say perfectly valid, I mean they're logically consistent as far as ample goes. Only one of those two constraints actually does what we want it to do, but ample doesn't know when it sees this dangling subscript j whether you meant to have j in the for all or in the sum. And so it just gives you a message saying, hey, this, this index is not defined. It doesn't tell you, oh, you forgot the for all part because it doesn't know if that's what you actually needed. Another thing that students have a tendency to do sometimes is to use the same index in the for all part of a constraint and then in the sum. And I see students make this mistake both on paper and when they're writing models in ample. Um, you need to use a different index in the sum if that sum is inside a constraint that has a for all. So if you look at this constraint, I said that the constraint should be for all j in projects. But then I also have a sum that says sum over j in projects, and that's the same j, the same index, and we can't do that. If you find yourself doing this, sometimes it means that you should be using a different index here, like for all j, but then sum over k. But also sometimes it means actually you really only wanted one or the other. You wanted a sum or a for all, but not both. And so you have to check your logic to make sure you're fixing it in the right way. But if you go to solve this model, of course, it'll give you a syntax error, or if, I'm sorry, if you go to load this model, it'll give you a syntax error that says, um, hey, the, the, there's a, a syntax error in this line and it points to the in. Um, the syntax error itself isn't that helpful. I wish it would say something like, you know, this is an index that you've already you declared and now you're trying to declare it again. Instead, it just says syntax error, but the fact that it points you to the in gives you a little clue that um, where it encountered the error is right at that point in the line. Of course, Ample will complain if you misspell a decision variable or parameter or constraint that you have declared differently. So if I leave out the E and select and I try to um, declare, a declare a decision variable that spells select incorrectly, then when I load the model file, it'll give me an error message. Again, it'll say select is not defined because of course I never defined a, a decision variable that's spelled like that. Don't forget that ample is case sensitive. So if I declare select with a capital S and then I try to use it with a lowercase s, exact same type of message. Another common mistake is to leave out some of the data. So in this case, I've left out the data line for the pool and only included the other three projects. This time the error doesn't happen until you try to solve the model. So you type model to load the model, you type data to load the data, and then when you go to solve, it says, oh, I can't actually process the objective function that you declared, because in the objective function, there's a lot, there's a um, curly braces that say J in projects. So when I try to loop through all the projects, I find, oh, there's a project here that I don't have any data for. And that's the error message that Ample gives. Ample also hates it when you leave out a semicolon. So here I've left off the semicolon at the end of the declaration of the, of the objective function. And when I go to load the model, I get a syntax error. Again, the syntax error isn't that, that helpful. Um, and actually the thing that it's pointing to is also a little confusing too. What Ample's actually pointing to in the syntax error is the next line, the subject to line. And the reason it points to the subject to line is that's where it figures out that something's wrong. So as far as Ample is concerned, since it doesn't care about white space, it gets to the end of your objective function and then it keeps reading and keeps thinking that what's coming next is should be part of the objective function. And Ample doesn't know how to put a subject to in an objective function, so that's when it realizes that something is wrong. But all this means is that actually in the line before it, you forgot your semicolon. If you forget a semicolon on the command line, Ample just prompts you for it. This always reminds me of like a parent waiting for a please. Ample knows what you mean, but it's gonna make you type that semicolon before it'll do what you want it to do. So it just gives you an ample question mark prompt if you've left off the semicolon, and then you just type the semicolon. You don't have to type the line again. Just type the semicolon, Ample forgives you and does the thing that you asked it to do. Okay, let's move on to another model. If you took 
an undergraduate operations research class using the textbook by Hillier and Lieberman, then you are surely familiar with Windor Glass, which is the example that they use throughout a good part of that book. And in the Windor Glass example, we have a factory, we have a company that makes windows and, and, and doors. And they have two different products they make at three different plants, three different factories. So we have decision variables that tell us how much we want to make of each project, a product, product one and product two. The objective function maximizes the total profit for each unit of product one that we make, we earn $3,000, let's say. And for each unit of pro product two, we make five. And we have constraints that enforce the plant capacities. So in plant one, I process product one and I can only make up to four of them per day, let's say. In plant two, I process product two. Each unit of product two takes two units of capacity. So the constraint says two X two less than or equal to 12. And in the in plant three, we have 18 units of capacity available. And each unit that I produce of product one takes three units and each unit of product two takes two units. So three X plus three X one plus two X two has to be less than or equal to 18. And these decision variables have to be non-negative. They don't have to be integer they can be continuous, continuous value variables. In algebraic notation, we have two sets, a set of plants and a set of products. We have three sets of parameters. RJ is the profit per batch of product J sold. BI is the number of available hours, the available capacity at plant J, uh, excuse me, at plant I. And AIJ is the production time per batch of product J made at plant I, in other words, the number of units of capacity at plant I that are used up by one unit that we produce of product J. There's one set of decision variables called XJ, and that's the number of batches of project product J that are produced. And when you write the model in algebraic form, it looks like this. This model is a little bit more complicated than the center county model. We now have two sets instead of one. We have a parameter that is indexed by both sets, the AIJ parameter. And we also have constraints that have both a for all and a sum. So it's not a hugely complicated model, but it's a bit more complicated than the one we did before. Here's the .mod file, which I called windor.mod. I've shown you the algebraic notation at the top again from the previous slide, and then my model file at the bottom. So you can pause the video and type in this model file. As you're doing it, pay attention to each of the lines and make sure that you understand the syntax of the line and how that line fits into the overall model and corresponds to the algebraic form of the model at the top. Here's my data file. So the table at the top shows us all the data in the original model. For each plant, we have the available hours and the amount of production time that each product takes. And for each product, we have the profit per batch. So my model file, my data file looks like this. At the top, we declare both sets, the plants and the products. We declare the profit parameter and the available hours parameter. And then we have the parameter hours per batch, which has two indices. And so we declare it as a sort of table. It looks a lot like the table that's above. The syntax is param, the name of the parameter, a colon. Then the indices for the second um, set that the parameter is indexed by. In this case, remember that the parameter aij, the first index is i, the second index is j. And so the i's are going to go down the rows of the table, and the j's are going to go across the columns of the table. So we list the indices, one, two, and then the colon equals. And then in each row, we first list the index i, one, two, three, and then we list the values of aij for that i. Again, this syntax is a bit finicky. I'm constantly forgetting what it should, how it should work and referring back to earlier examples. You can enter what's in the data file, pause the video if you need to, and when you're done, come back and let's solve it. Reset your model if you need to. Type model window.mod, data window.dat, and solve it. And Cplex finds the optimal solution, which if you remember back to your undergraduate 
intro to OR class is two comma six, and the optimal objective function value is 36. And I obtained the optimal values of the decision variables, again, using the display command, display followed by the name of my decision variable. Okay, let's talk about a few other things that you should know about how, how Ample works, and then I'll give you an example to try on your own. First of all, Ample can interface with lots of different solvers. One of the beautiful things about Ample is that you can write your model in data files, and then even though different solvers need to get the information in different formats, Ample, Ample handles all of that for you. So remember that the solver is the code that actually does the optimization, but the Ample inputs, the model and data files, and the Ample outputs that you get from the solver are the same regardless of the solver. For most purposes, I find that Cplex and Garobi are sufficient. They can solve linear programs, integer programs, some types of nonlinear programs, and lots of other types of problems. But these are commercial solvers and you need a license for them. So if you can't get a license for those solvers, you can find open source solvers that will um, hopefully do what you need them to do. Lots of times you'll find yourself wanting to declare sets of numbers. So if I need a set that consists of all the numbers from one to 20, I don't wanna to have to type all those numbers. So Ample gives you some syntax to do that. You can declare the set, let's say periods, colon equals one dot dot 20. And that means all the integers between one and 20. You can also use the by notation to say that the set should not have all the consecutive numbers, but should skip. So five dot dot 50 by five means go from five to 50 in increments of five. One common pattern is to declare the set size in the .mod file and then declare the set based on the size also in the .mod file and finally specify the size in the .dat file. So for example, in the mod file, you might have a parameter called t, then a set called periods that consists of all the integers from one to t. And finally, in your .dat file, you'll tell Ample that t equals a certain value like 20. The dot dot notation can only be used in mod files, not in dot dat files. So you couldn't in your dat file say set periods equals one dot dot t or one dot dot 20. You can only do that in a mod file. You can also use sets of numbers without explicitly declaring them as sets. So for example, instead of declaring a set called periods that has all the integers from one to t, you can just, you can just use the, the notation one dot dot t to declare your parameters and decision variables and summation indices and so on. But I find it cleaner to declare these as sets. Instead of writing one dot dot t every time you want to use it, just declare a set called periods that consists of one dot dot t and use that instead. Now you can impose conditions on parameters in the model file that look a lot like the conditions that you might impose on decision variables. But it's important to realize that these are not constraints, they're just validation rules. So for example, you can declare your parameters with things like greater than or equal to zero or strictly greater than zero. You can specify that they have to be binary or integer or even greater than or equal to seven. But all those de declarations are doing is telling Ample, when you load my data file, if my data that I gave you doesn't follow these rules, then, then throw an error. So for example, if in the dat file, I declare the budget as 200, but the land available as negative 15, when in my mod file, I said that the land available has to be greater than zero, then when I run the data, when I load the model and data files and try to solve, I'll get an error message. So again, this is not a constraint that I'm adding because it doesn't include any decision variables. It's just a validation on the data itself. You can do operations on the sets. You can declare sets and then combine them with keywords like union or inter for intersection. Diff gives you the, um, the difference, the set difference between two sets. Sim diff gives you what's called the symmetric difference, everything that's in the first set or the second set, but not both. Cross gives you the Cartesian product. So the pairs that, that each come from the sets. And this is useful because for example, in some models you might wanna declare two different types of nodes like suppliers and factories, and then have another set that contains all the nodes, both the suppliers and the factories using the union operator. And you can do other things, other operations on other sets as needed. 
If you find yourself repeating the same commands over and over again at the ample prompt, it's often useful to use what's called a .run file. So this is the third type of file that you can use in ample. And a run file is a script, and it consists of standard ample commands. Anything that you can type at the ample prompt, you can put in a run file. So for example, you can build a run file called windor.run and type these commands into it. These are the commands that we already typed at the ample prompt. And then after you save windor.run, at the ample prompt, you can just type include windor.run, and then that one single line will tell ample to execute all the commands in the run file. This is super useful just for repeating things that you find yourself doing over and over again, like resetting the model, loading the model, loading the data, solving the problem, declaring, uh, displaying your decision variables, which you'll find yourself doing over and over as you, as you create and debug a model. But run files are even more powerful. For example, they'll let you loop using for loops or while loops. They'll let you set values of parameters. They'll let you print information to the screen and so on. So in this little script, I've told Ample that I want to load the Windor model. I want to create a new set called hours to test. So basically the experiment I'm doing here is saying, if the right-hand side of the constraint for plant three changes, how does the optimal profit change? So I'm creating a set of hours that I want to test in the right-hand side of that constraint. And that, um, that set, hours to test, is going to start at my current value of available hours for plant three and go to the current value plus 10 in increments of two. So right now, available hours for plant three equals 18. So this is saying I want to go from 18 to 28 in increments of two. Then I have a loop. The syntax looks like this. We have four and then put the, the index and the set that you're looping over in curly braces. And then if you have more than one command in your for loop, that also gets enclosed in curly braces, just like in C or C++ or many other languages. And what I'm doing in each iteration of that loop is to replace avail hours three with my new value of the number of hours I want to test. I solve the model and then I print a statement that indicates how many, what the optimal profit is. So here's an example of what the um, ample commands look like. I include windor.run, cplex solves and gives me some messages. Then I have the, the, the line that I printed that says avail hours three equals 18 implies that the optimal profit is 36. And then the loop repeats and changes the value of available hours. Now in, this, in the output here, I've cut out some of the lines that Cplex includes just for the sake of saving space, but it gives me the printf line for each value in the set that I'm testing. And not surprisingly, as the available hours increases, so does the optimal profit. But at a certain point, the optimal profit stops increasing because that constraint is no longer active, meaning adding more capacity to that plant won't help us anyway. So the objective function stays the same. You can use if then else conditions in a run file. So for example, in the script that I had before, we could have a if statement that says, if the amount that I produce of product one is greater than three, then print a line that says I'm producing more than three batches. And if, and otherwise, I print a line that says I'm producing fewer than three batches. And when I do that and run the, the script, I get outputs that say, when the available hours is 18, I produce fewer than three batches. When it's 20, I produce fewer than three batches. When it's 22, I produce more than three batches, and so on. Why you would want this particular output, I don't know, but it's just an example of how you would use an if statement, and in particular, an if statement within a for loop. OK, your turn. Here's another problem, which we'll call the fixed charge problem. We have n products that we can manufacture. And for each product J, we have a fixed cost KJ if we manufacture it. If we choose to manufacture it, we're going to pay that fixed cost regardless of how much we manufacture. And then we also pay a variable cost CJ per unit that we manufacture. We earn a profit of PJ for each unit sold of product J. And there's a demand potential DJ, meaning if I produce up to DJ, I'm going to sell everything I produce. And if I produce more than DJ, then the extra is not going to get sold. So in other words, I'm not going to produce more than DJ of product J. We have M raw materials available. 
Each unit of product J manufactured requires AIJ units of raw material I, and there are BI units of raw material I available. And our goal is to select the product mix, in other words, which products should we produce and in what quantities in order to maximize the net profit. Net profit meaning the profit that I earn minus the cost. Here's the model in algebraic form. We want to maximize the sum over all the products, the profit of that product times how much of the product I produce, minus the cost. So for each product, we have a fixed cost if we manufacture the product, and that's indicated by a binary decision variable delta J. And we also have a variable cost for each unit that we produce, and the number of units that we produce of product J is indicated by the decision variable XJ. The first set of constraints says for each raw material, I can only produce products that will not exceed the amount of that raw material available. The second set of constraints says I should not produce, it says two things actually. It says if delta J, the binary variable is zero, meaning I'm not producing that product, then XJ has to be zero. Or if you wanna think of it a different way, this constraint says, if I'm going to produce anything, if xj is anything bigger than zero, then delta j has to be one. And this constraint also says that I shouldn't produce more than dj. So if delta j is one, I'm producing the product, but the right-hand side then equals dj, so this says don't make more than dj. The xj variables are continuous and non-negative, and the delta j variables are binary. This is another example that comes from this, the book by Ravindran et al. Here's some data that you can use for the fixed charge problem. Again, for each available resource or raw material, we have a certain number of units available. We have a certain number of units that each product requires of that raw material or that resource. And then for each product, we have a fixed cost, a variable cost, a sales price, and a sales potential. I'm leaving this slide blank so I don't accidentally show you the answer. Why don't you pause the video here and try to build the model and the data file based on the model and the data that I gave you on the previous slides. This could take you a while. This is not just a simple exercise, um, but it's a real test of your newfound ample experience, your expertise, and um, you'll probably run into some syntax errors as you do it. Hopefully the tips I gave you before will help you diagnose those and fix those. Once you have a model that you believe is working, come back to the video and I will show you my model file and my data file. Okay, here's my model file for the fixed charge problem. Of course, there are lots and lots of different ways that you could do this. You might have used totally different names for the parameters and sets and decision variables. That's totally fine. You might have even formulated some of the constraints and, and obje the objective function a little bit differently than I did, that's fine too. As long as we're doing the same thing, we'll achieve the same results. Here's my data file. Again, you might have used a different format. You might have declared each of the parameters se in separate groups instead of in one big table and so on. All that's fine as long as you're doing it in a way that Ample knows how to interpret. And finally, here's my ample transcript. I loaded the model, I loaded the data, I solved it, I displayed the values of the decision variables, and this is what it gives me. So in other words, we produce products one, two, and four. We make 51.25 units of product one, 75 units of product two, and 60 units of product four, and we get an optimal profit of 2665. That's the end of this tutorial. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of it. Thanks for being here.